Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise it's good to be in the house of God again. We're going to get started with our program. Song service. Amen. Amen. How many of you came to lift the name of the Lord tonight? Oh, how many of you came to lift the name of the Lord tonight? One person. All right. Say, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Say, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I love to sing your praises.
Good evening, Oakwood. Good evening, Oakwood. We'd like to welcome you out to the first night of our Student Week of Prayer. The theme is Lost in Translation, um, where we delve into God's Word and we want to seek how Christ fits into everything we believe. He's not just a figure, he's not just a fairy tale, but Christ is the sole source and sole purpose of Scripture. Um, the theme for tonight is salvation, the experience of salvation. The theme for tonight is the experience of salvation. Oftentimes we have concluded that we have time to choose. We um, can make a decision when we want to or how we want to, but there are certain things in life that we can't wait on. For instance, if, if you ever found yourself in a time where money was tight and we were going through a tough time, while it may be tough then, things can get better. If you didn't have enough money to eat, it had been tough then, but things eventually can get better. If you're finding a hard time to pay for gas, I know I do sometimes, amen? Things eventually can get better. There's always time for things to get better, but the one risk we, the one risk we run in not choosing Jesus today is that if we don't make that decision today, we may never have the opportunity to choose him again. If we don't choose him in that instant, during those appeals where we're asked, and we, and we, and we, can tell, we tell ourselves that tomorrow is better than today, there's still things that we need to work out in our lives. Um, we conclude that I still have time, but we need to make our decision to follow the Lord each day. Also, this week, uh, as we go through a week of prayer, we'll have prayer hot spots uh, at 1 o'clock each day. What time did I say? At 1 o'clock each day, we will be meeting at different parts of the campus. Uh, we'll have a, a prayer hot spot in front of the market, a prayer hot spot in the cafeteria, and a prayer hot spot by Eternal Flame. You can go there, you can pray, you can ask me special prayer, and because we really want to saturate our campus with prayer. You know, Oftentimes, as, as, as a young leader, I conclude that maybe I have some dynamic plan or some way that we can raise spirituality, but the only way to true revival is through prayer. It's not by nice ideas, it's not by catchphrases, it's not by uh, hearing great sermons time and time again. It's by me, myself, getting on my knees and telling God that I need his help. At this time, we want to give out a, a gift card, and this one's easy, because I, I announced it during the welcome, so if you don't know, it means you weren't paying attention. What is our theme for this week? Wow, I didn't pick you, though. I saw Antonio first, I'll be honest. I mean, not Antonio, um, Anthony. Now, I got to switch the question, though, now. What is the theme for tonight's week of prayer? You got off the answer. I can't give it to you like that. I announced that during this, this time, too. No. Donette. Yes. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Anthony. Blame Storm. Salvation. Congratulations. You have a point. $25 gift card to Target. Each night, understand, each night, pay attention, because I'm giving away even better prizes each night. That's, that's just to kick it off, but we have better things in store. I, I can promise you that. Good evening, everyone. I'm here today to share my testimony with you guys. Okay, my testimony starts in, um, well, first off, has anybody ever warned anybody, or has God ever warned anybody in here? <laughs> well, in 2006, when I first came to Oakwood, God warned me. He didn't warn me through 
somebody telling me, put an idea in my head. And that idea was that the first time, not the second, not the third, the fourth, nor the fifth, but the first time that I have sex, I'm going to get pregnant. <laughs> sure enough, I mean, I went through my whole first year, I'm believing this concept, I'm like, no, I'm going to stay, I'm not going to, but about three months before school let out, I was like, how likely is that really? But sure enough, it happened. And I, it took me this time to realize that God had to bring me down, he had to break me down to the lowest level so I realized that I needed him in my life, that I could not do this on my own to reveal himself to me. So once I surrendered, I've been, I was prayed, and I was like, God, okay, it's out of my hands. Like, I know I need you in my life. I know I've been lacking you before. So it wasn't until I surrendered my, every, my everything to him that he started to show the plans that he had for me. And um, I want to say 2008, I came back to Oakwood um, with the intention of dropping my sister off. I was helping my mom drive, you know, standing in financial aid lines for her. And then she got cleared and everything, and I was going to go home. On my way out, on our way out, we drove by New Beginnings. And I was like, okay, it's a single parent resource center. I did want to come back to Oakwood because they had my major, and not everyone had my major. So I drive in there, you know, just to see what they had to offer. And she, the director, the den director, asked me, why aren't you coming back to school? I was like, well, I don't have any place to stay. I don't have child care. I'm not even enrolled. She was like, well, we were blessed with four apartments, and the girl dropped out two days ago, and there's a free vacant apartment that you can have that will be put on your tuition. I'm like, okay. But I still not enrolled in school. I don't have child care. I don't have a job. She was like, we will watch um, Jeremiah, which is my son's name, for up to four hours a day free of charge while you're in class. I was like, okay. So then I started thinking. It's like, okay, this is spontaneous. I mean, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm already enrolled in school back home. I have a babysitter. I have everything that was set. I had my own plans. But I took some time, and I prayed about it. And I was like, okay, God, if you want me to come back to school, then let me get cleared tomorrow. I don't have time to play games. I have to. I have a job. I have stuff that I have to get back to. Sure enough, sorry, the next day, um, I went through the whole registration process. I got readmitted, and then I was at the last step, the financial aid line. So I'm like, okay, well, this is going to make it or break it. I get there, and I had everything I needed but my W-2s. So I knew exactly where they were, at home on my dresser. Okay, so I'm like, okay, I'm not going to get discouraged this easily. Let's just give it a couple hours, see what happens. So I called my old employer, who gave me the number to somewhere, who gave me the website to somewhere, where I could print my W-2s off for $6. Took it back to financial aid and got cleared. I was like, okay, so I guess I'm supposed to be here. So then I go home, no money now. Pack up my clothes, Jeremiah's clothes. Then I come back, nothing else. So I was like, okay, we at least need, at least need a bed to sleep on. So I call my friend, who's an RA at Carter Hall, and they have some extra mattresses. I was like, okay, so we have some mattresses. We're sleeping on the floor with some mattresses. I get back to school, and Evan, we, he takes me to Walmart, and I'm just, you know, Following him around in Walmart, I was like, I have no money. Like, why are we even in Walmart? He just starts putting stuff in the car. He puts um, pots and pans and food. He's like, well, you're going to need stuff. I'm just like, oh, okay. <laughs> so we get there. I've got, oh, we got some cleaning supplies too. So I've got a clean house, and I've got a bed, and I've got some groceries. Um, but how am I going to get to school now? So... Um, I, went to, I asked my neighbors um, if they had 8 o'clock classes, because that's when I need to be on campus. One, one, um, one of my neighbors did have an 8 o'clock class on one day, but on the rest of the day, she didn't have class till 10. But she volunteered to take me to school, me and Jeremiah, to school every day at 8 o'clock. So I had a ride to school. And two weeks, I, I kid you not, every week for like the first couple months I was there, 
God just blessed me, and I got something new for my apartment. I got curtains, I got dressers. Two weeks after I got there, someone offered me a job. Before I even realized, oh, wait, you're going to need some money. God provided. Um, he just continually blessed me. That was that semester. The following semester, it's really hard having a six-month-old without a car. But my daddy came down, and then the following semester, he, uh, he saw how much I needed a car, and he just gave me a car. He got a car for $175, and he brought it to me. So I had a car. And just every single semester after that, God continually blessed me. He blessed me with a new couch, a bed. I didn't even ask for it. People just gave to me. And even the next year, I had a heavy load, and God, he brought me through it. I had 18 hours, and he allowed me to get practically straight A's. So I just want to leave this text with you guys, and then I'm going to sit down. It's found in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know our plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And this text to me just shows me that if you surrender your will to God, then he will bless you and continually bless you. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Our theme this evening is salvation, right? Amen. So how many of you know that God is able Amen. to save we who are lost? So we're just going to sing He's able really quick. And then we're going to get out your way.
Good night. How are you all doing? Um, I hope you all brought you all's Bibles. It's time for the scripture reading. Um, as you pull them out, I'll give you some time. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. And when you have it, please stand up and say amen. And even if you don't have it, please stand. Okay, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and, not, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. May God bless the hearers, the readers, and the doers of his will. You may be seated. to accept the life in the darkness. Years from now, I can only tell my children not to Good evening. Amen. 
Um, I'm not up here to sing this evening. I am here actually to introduce the speaker. Um, it was really interesting how we met. We were in a Greek class and we both thought, well, that was not the first time. First time was in Dr. Malcolm's uh, philosophy of Christian education class. And we both, I heard some O's, <laughs> and we both sort of looked at each other and kind of thought the other was strange. We were both sort of intrigued as to who the other one really was. Um, after that, it was a Greek class, and by really by happenstance, she ended up coming over to my house to study with another girl in the class um, for the final. And it was in that meeting where God decided to start to blossom our friendship, which very quickly turned into a sisterhood. Um, I could run down her resume, my Lord, have mercy. Um, <laughs> um, in terms of preaching, those of us who know L'Oreal, we know that if you are in the financial clearance line, if you are in line at the cafeteria, at a table in the cafeteria, in class, L'Oreal is not going to miss an opportunity to preach the Word of God. Um, and I admire that courage in her. Um, one of the things um, that you may know about her also is that she's a literature evangelist extraordinaire. She's done it for years and is really good at it. And it's that same canvassing spirit where she gets that fire to just preach to anybody. We were literally at the thrift store on Friday. And she stopped somebody. <laughs> and as I was looking for a skirt, at the end of the skirt out, she is praying with one of the workers in the thrift shop. So when you talk about somebody who lives the kind of Christian life that they preach about, L'Oreal indeed is that woman. She is a woman of God who is vested with the power and authority and the spirit of God. And it is my prayer tonight that as you hear her heart, that you would also hear the Lord speaking to you. Thank you. I am lost in blindness. And I refuse to believe that I can see. One has to accept a life of darkness. Years from now, I can only tell my children not to believe that simple grace triumphs over utter darkness. I was born in sin, and I was conceived in sin. It doesn't matter to God that I live every day of my life in hopelessness. No longer can it be said that there is a God who hears the cries of his people. My whole life testifies to one truth. Blindness has robbed me of every good thing. And it is no longer true that God saves those who are crushed in spirit. Now I don't know much, but I know one thing for sure. I was born blind with no hope and no future. But then I met Jesus turned everything in my life upside down. I was born blind with no hope and no future. Now I don't know much, but I know one thing for sure. God saves those who are crushed in spirit. And it is no longer true that blindness has robbed me of every good thing. My whole life testifies to one truth. There is a God Here's the prize of this people. No longer can it be said that I live every day of my life in hopelessness. It doesn't matter to God that I was born in sin and I was conceived in sin. Simple grace triumphs over every darkness. Years from now, I can only tell my children not to believe that one has to accept a life of darkness. I can see and I refuse to believe that I am lost in blindness.
Hello. Good evening, everyone. You gave me my hands to reach out to man, to show him your love and your perfect plan. You gave me my ears. I can hear your voice so clear. I can hear you the cry the sinners, but can I wipe away their tears? You gave me my voice to sing out your word, to sing all your praises to those who never heard. With my eyes, I see the need for more availability. I've seen hearts that have been broken for many people to be free. Lord, I'm available to you. My will I give to you. I'll do what you say. Do use me, Lord, to show the world the way and enable me to say my story is empty. And I am available to you. Now I'm giving back to you all the tools you gave to me. My hands, my ears, my voice, my eyes, so you can use them as you please. I have emptied out my cup so that you can fill me up. Now I'm free and I just want to be more available to you. My Lord, I'm available to you. My will I give to you. I'll do what you say to use me, Lord, to show the world the way and enable me to say my story is empty and I am available to you.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I don't know if you all know I'm a worshiper. Um, that song that the praise team sung, Don't Give Up on God, because He Won't Give Up on You. Sometimes you have to say that over and over and over again. So if the band can help me, I guess I'll pitch my own note. Don't give up on God, cause He won't give up on you. Sing. Don't give up on God, cause He won't give up on you. Say, don't give up on God, cause He won't give up on you. Say, don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. He's able. Sometimes I have to sing that because the life can bring about circumstances that make you distrust Christ. But he said that he'll never change. So I have to tell myself, don't give up on God. Because he won't give up on you. Because he's able, not me. Because he's able. Amen. Amen. So, I have a very interesting sermon. Tonight, I'm not really talking to you, I'm kind of talking to me. And what I thought about doing was sitting in the audience and sitting by one of you all and us reading the Bible together. That was a thought in my mind because I'm the person that the Bible's talking about. See, it's different when you come to the Bible, you're like those people. But it's a different thing when you have to include yourself with those people. So I want you to know that this is going to be a very, very personal sermon because it touches my heart. This has been the hardest sermon yet. And the reason why it's the hardest sermon, and what, what are we talking about tonight? Anybody remembers? Salvation. Because part of salvation is what? Someone help me. It is faith. Sanctification. And do you know how long sanctification takes? Oh, a lifetime. So I can preach something now that's still currently going on in my life at this present moment. And then it has, by God's grace and my faith in Him, it has future implications on glorification. Are y'all following me? Anytime a minister preaches salvation, they're currently in the process. So to be able to tell that to you does something to me because I'm sitting down like this, reading the scripture with you. Because I am, like everyone else in the audience, is currently in the process. And that's what makes this so hard. So bear with me, okay? All right, so let's pray, and I'm going to get into the Word. Amen? Amen. 
Did y'all bring your Bibles? Oh, I'm excited. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to be able to proclaim a message about you. I realize that it's coming through a messed up vessel. It's coming through, Father, someone who still currently struggles. And I pray, God, that you will expose me, make me authentic, do whatever you have to do so that we can be saved. God, we thank you that before we already call, you have an answer. And while we are yet speaking, God, you hear us right now. We thank you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're going to start off with um, a little story. In preparing this sermon, it started off to be easy because the process of doing it becomes a ritual when you prepare sermons. I find a text pray over the text. I ask myself a question to the text. I let the text answer the question. The issue with that is, is that I wasn't in that. It was just something I was learning to do. So what happened, God said, L'Oreal, go back to six months before. This is where you're going to get your message from. Go back six months, a year before, and I need you to go back to who you truly are, and that's the rich young ruler. That's going to set the backdrop for what Storm just read, Ephesians chapter 2. So what I'm going to do is tell you what I'm about to do before I do it. Is that okay with you? So you can follow me. I'm about to set the backdrop of the rich young ruler in his life. Then I'm going to show you how he didn't fully understand Christ and the invitation to salvation that's explained in Ephesians chapter 2. And that when you truly understand it, you can't help but say, I want to follow you, Jesus. Even though, even though, even though, and here's the, here's the big, here's the big end, even though it may hurt. That's why I'm a tip thing to do, okay? So, six months ago, um, this was about a year ago or um, so, so to speak, and I was sitting in my friend's house, and we decided to watch Prince of Egypt. And in watching Prince of, Prince of Egypt, we stayed up until about midnight, and with that being done, or with that being said, we stayed up until about midnight, and... We went to sleep. The next following morning, I woke up and I started my devotion. And starting my devotion, it was what I normally do or I'm supposed to do. Um, that is, I, um, I pray. I read Desire of Ages, and then I open up the Bible to see it line up. So I did that this, this morning, and something wasn't right in me. I don't know if you all have ever went to the Word of God and you just wasn't feeling it, but you did it because you knew it was the right thing to do. Yeah, this was one of those times. When I was there, I said, okay, I told you I was going to do it. I'm tired of being the person who comes down for the appeal and promise all these things to you and then don't do it because I don't feel it. So I said, because I told you I was going to do it, God, I'm going to open up the Word. I'm just letting you know I'm not feeling this thing right now. So I opened up the Word. This particular desire of ages was on the rich young ruler. And God said, this is where I'm going to meet you at. Open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. When you have it, say amen. Amen. Now, Mark chapter 10 is very interesting because it starts off with actually marriage and divorce. From there, it goes to Jesus blessing the children in verse 13. Jesus blessed the children in verse 13. You continue on down. He says, As surely I say unto you, verse 15, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child would by no means enter in it. 
And now we have, right after he says that, it says, and he took them up in his arms and he laid hands on them and did what, you all? That's very important. He blessed them. Now, just right now, I just want to stop. What kind of blessing was it? Did he give the children trinkets and candy? No, that's very important. What kind of blessing was it? I heard it over here. Spiritual blessing. Good, 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 good. So we go down from there. And verse 17 now enters into who I am. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt down before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do? Or what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. First thing you see him doing is seeking. What do you think he's seeking for? Y'all going to talk to me. Yes, he is. How do we know that it's spiritual and not material? Because, yeah, but, yeah, I'm further down in the text because the text does say that he's rich. But one of the reasons how you know that he's seeking something more than materialism is his posture. What does the Bible say he did? He knelt. His posture showed you that he's seeking more than just material. He wanted to know the truth concerning eternal life, says Matthew. Now, if you back up, we just read, if you back up in verses 13 and 14, Jesus just finished blessing the who? The children. Was this material blessing? No. How do we know that? Well, we know that because they were not getting trinkets. (laughs) They were not getting candy. He came to him rich already. Okay? The rich young ruler came to him prior. He was already rich. He already had something called possessions. He already had possessions before he came to Jesus. So his first point of coming to Jesus is because he came to Jesus to seek him. More importantly, a spiritual blessing. So Jesus gave the children a spiritual blessing. He came seeking a spiritual blessing. He next approaches Jesus with an incomplete understanding of eternal life. He says, firstly, 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 he does something right. Now, I said that he approached Jesus with an incomplete understanding of eternal life. But what he does do right is that he approaches Jesus. Amen? Now, this is interesting to me because oftentimes... Some people tend to rely on, I guess, religious teachers or rely on preachers or very informed personnel to tell you about your destiny. Moreover, not just your current earthly destiny, but the one to come. But this religious teacher who had so much religion, because the Bible doesn't just call him rich, but he's a young man, he's rich, and he's a religious ruler. So he wasn't just working with just any type of knowledge. He had knowledge of religious things. And knowledge of religious things, why would he seek out someone and then call them good? When he said of himself, is there one thing that I can do that's good that would inherit my eternal life. So why would he seek out someone else that is good when he says of himself that he is good and that whatever he could do, good teacher, is it one good thing that I can do to inherit eternal life, says the rich young ruler? So he seeks out God. And his understanding is incomplete. He thought Jesus was just a good teacher. He thought he can do a good thing to inherit eternal life. He thought he could keep the commandments if we continue with the story. Now, Jesus uses this incomplete understanding to draw him in. The first thing Jesus does is points to his incomplete understanding. There is none good but who? God. Or the scripture says there's none good but one. So he points to the fact that his understanding is complete. You call me good. And, you know, we say it all the time, God is good. And all the time. But do we really mean that? And the reason why I ask that statement is because all 
oftentimes, oftentimes, if God is good, then what are you expecting to come out from Him? Good things. Even His commands? Let me get a little closer. I told you I'm talking to myself. If God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, then anything that God can ever ask of you should be what? But do we ever see it from that perspective? No, and he didn't either. And that's what point that, that that's one of our issues right there, y'all. That that's one of the issues. You know why? Because we now say, like the rich young ruler, because if you continue with the story, not only did he have an incomplete understanding of what God was asking, or rather him asking of eternal life, he called God good. Which in fact God said there is none good but one. Which is, well, he was insinuating that it was him, but of course the rich young ruler would have to have said that of himself. But he calls God good or good teacher. And God points to his incomplete understanding there is only one that's good. Then he gives him an income, impossible task to test. What, what test did he give him? What test did he give, give him? Hmm? to sell all his possessions. Now, it's a little deeper than that because Matthew 19, 17 says that he gave them task to keep the commandments. Then Jesus gave him that task beholding him and loving him. He gave him the task to keep all the commandments. But the first five were from the Decalogue. Now, this is what shook me. The first five commandments that Jesus gave him to do, verse 19, in Matthew, verse 19, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said all these things. But if you continue in Matthew chapter 19, 19, turn there right quick. Someone turn there right quick for me. Matthew 19, 19, what commandment did Jesus add to it? These were from the Ten Commandments, but what commandment did Jesus add to it? Love thy neighbor as thyself. So Jesus brings something important out that what he was trying to emphasize was love. Love thy neighbor as thyself. The first five were from the original Ten Commandments, and it exposes the rich young ruler's real love. So when he says to sell all your possessions and then take up your cross and follow me, it exposes what he truly loves. When Jesus read that commandment, which was not in the Decalogue, he said, I kept all of them. And he was not able, he was not able to give up what Jesus had asked for. It showed exactly what he truly loved. For the things that you love, you hold dear to your heart, right? Right, and that's exactly what the rich young ruler did. Now, this is where we're about to flip the script. The Lord's loving invitation. The rich young ruler has an issue. His issue is that he loves something more than Christ. So, if you read Desire of Ages, if you continue to read, you'll see that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it'll say, there's one thing that thou lackest. Or there's one thing that you're missing. And you can tell the implications of that thing based upon what Jesus quoted. And he said, love thy neighbor as thyself in Matthew. Now, Jesus makes an invitation based upon that. And he invites the rich young ruler to take up his cross and follow him. Now, this is the main issue of the text. It's the invitation. I think this is the hardest issue there is because oftentimes we're always invited to Jesus. I have to sit and ask myself the question, what happens when people are invited or have an invitation to a house or to a home and they don't come? What random things can go through your mind that makes you not come to someone's house? Someone tell me. What would make you not go to someone's house? It's dirty. You don't like them. Somebody said something about the food. The fast food Benedict. Okay. Bad company. 
too busy. You said pets? Transportation. <laughs> Storm. <laughs> have to do that to my sermon. So he makes an invitation for him to take up his cross and follow him and give it all away. We made the transition. Now I'm talking to you today because this talks to me. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's learn a little bit more about this invitation. I'm going to tell you why he didn't accept it. Ephesians chapter 1. Let me show you something. Follow me in Ephesians chapter 1. So, some things you need to know about this invitation. When God invites you to come follow him. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Now talk to me. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? Every what? Spiritual what? What was the rich one you what was the rich young ruler seeking God for? Spiritual blessing. What does Ephesians say in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3? And that in, where is his spiritual blessing? In Christ. Okay? Okay? I'm about to build. The Bible says that his spiritual blessing that is in heavenly places is in who? In Christ. Verse 4. Now what is verse 4 saying? Just as he chose us in who? In him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now verse 5, watch this. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by who? So Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 says that in Christ we are adopted. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says in Christ we have spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Keep going. 1 verse 6 says, according to his grace, he made us accepted in the beloved. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, in Christ we have redemption. So it's about to make a whole run of everything you have in Christ. Now, the rich young ruler did not know this. He had no clue as to what God was offering him. It's about to make an entire run of everything in Christ. Now, I'm doing this for a reason. Because oftentimes when people preach Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, you don't see what Paul is doing in the Scriptures. He is lining them up to receive Christ in their heart. By saying that you're not missing out on anything in Christ, you are blessed. You have spiritual blessings in heavenly places. In Christ, you are adopted. In Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, you have redemption. In Christ, you have been forgiven of not just your sins, but your trespasses. So Paul sets them up in chapter 1 to receive what's about to come in chapter 2. So, verse 7, in Christ you have what? Redemption. 7B, in Christ we have what? Forgiveness. 9, in Christ we know his what? His will. Whoa, how many people don't know the will of God right now? <laughs> it's all right to raise your hand. When they're confused. But Ephesians says in Christ, we know the mystery of his will. This is what the Bible says. This is why it was hard for me to accept y'all. They told me that if I'm in Christ, I'm supposed to know the mystery of his will. Oh, it get better than this. It get better than this. And I only know the mystery of his will. Verse 10. In Christ, there is what? Oneness or unity. Verse 11, in Christ, we have obtained a what? Inheritance. Verse 13, in Christ, we are what? We are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. This was the invitation 
that the rich young ruler was invited to. But on the outskirts, it just looked like Jesus was saying, give this up. No, give this up. How many of you all, when God asks you to do something, you just look at it externally? But you really don't know that he's inviting you into a deeper relationship with him. So when I turned to Ephesians, I read, one, redemption in Christ, spiritual blessing, promise of the seal, in Christ's forgiveness, in Christ's unity. So if I was married, if I'm in Christ with my husband, I have unity. Oh, if, conditional statement. I'm in Christ with him. We have unity. There is oneness in Christ. I have all this stuff in Christ that people kill over. In Christ, I am adopted. In Christ, I have acceptance. You know what females and males do to be accepted at Oakwood? Oh, come on, somebody. How many of y'all ever did some crazy stuff to be accepted? I know I have. I ain't gonna sit here and lie. I've done some crazy stuff to be accepted, especially when I went to public school. I rolled my skirt up a little higher. Didn't I, Antonio? <laughs> Actually, this is just, it's just a suggestion. But um, I rolled my skirt up a little higher, had a little slang, had a little different walk, a little different talk. We do crazy stuff to be accepted. But the Bible says in Christ you are accepted just the way you are. You ain't trying to prove nothing to nobody. See, out of Christ, we do a whole bunch of stuff to try to prove ourselves. And we still do it now. The choice of how you wear your hair, for a lot of people, is to prove something. Let's be for real. The choice of whoever you're with, when it comes to boyfriend or girlfriend, especially, expect, well, let me not put no emphasis on one gender. Both female and male. <laughs> When we're trying to prove something to someone else, we choose somebody specifically so that we can prove it. If I want to prove something to my mom, I specifically bring over the certain type of male that she wants me to have. Don't have to be interested in him, but I am trying to prove something. Mama, I am that good child that you raised, and I know you want this type of male, so I'm going to bring this male over for you. And so I bring him over, and we put on this facade so that she can see. And then once we leave her gates, then we depart. When you're trying to prove something in class, what do we do when try to prove something in class? Oh, y'all mighty quiet in here. Y'all ain't never tried to prove something? What do you do when you try to prove something to your spouse? Or to your boyfriend or to your girlfriend? For females, what do you do when you try to prove how beautiful you are because you look at another girl that he was looking at? But he's with you. And so in order to keep him, you try to prove yourself to him. And so now you're, you go change your hair. You change what you normally would not do. And you become what you would not be in order to prove that he should love you. Same thing for males. It's that one particular girl that you after. So you study her. <laughs> and you have conversations with her as to what kind of male she likes. And you become everything that she wants. But it's not who you truly are. But once you get her, especially in marriage, you stop doing those things. Talking about proving. In Christ, we are what? Accepted. I don't have to prove to nobody who I am. Because Christ already knows who I am. This is the invitation, y'all, that the rich young ruler, because remember, he's rich, which means what? Stuff that starts with a P. What? Possessions. He is a ruler, which means what? Starts with a P. Position. We're about to go there. We're about to go there. And he's a young man, which means what? Not just power, but something else. Pride or, or, or proud. Any of your parents say you should be proud of yourself. You better walk with dignity. Be proud of yourself. He had, he was proud, he had possessions, and he had positions. So when he came to Jesus, he was banking to the world. He had everything we pray for and come down to the altars for. God, I need this position at McDonald's. You know I need a check. 
Lord, you know I need that house, that car. He had it all. But yet there was something that the rich young ruler was lacking. That thing puzzled me. How you can have it all and still be not satisfied. You know what the title of my sermon was? There's something wrong with me. I'm not satisfied. Y'all say that with me. There's something wrong with me. I'm not satisfied. Because here at Oakwood, you all may trade in what the rich lawyer you ruler was actually coming for for him. It switches. We start, and I'm saying we because it was me. We start freshman year, Lord Jesus, they sent me here to get you. I need you. And by senior year, we're competing in the departments. By senior year, we want positions. By senior year, we need possessions. By senior year, we can be proud of yourself. Walk with dignity down the stage. We flip the script by senior year. It is so easy to do. Notice I say we flip the script by senior year. So God was talking to me. He's like, Gloria, you don't understand salvation, boo. Because if you did, you wouldn't be the rich man ruler. So he said, continue to teach you. So in Christ, we have all these things. In Christ, you all have adoption, acceptance, Redemption, forgiveness, wisdom, inheritance, soul of the Holy Spirit, life, grace, citizenship, every spiritual blessing. And now it leads us to my favorite, and then I'm about to end it close. Here we get to the good part. Not that the rest of it has been bad, but you all now learn in chapter two that you are made alive. Now, this is crazy because I thought the rich young ruler was alive. But the Bible says, as I parallel, in you he made alive, in you he made alive who were dead. Now, my car died during spring break, and I was talking to Tanya on the phone, and I said, I think God will be put this in my sermon, so I'm going to put it in there. And I said to her on the phone, I said, you know what's so funny? I keep getting all this work done on my car. I take it to mechanic after mechanic. I read the manual, but this thing still doesn't want to start. So somebody said, L'Oreal, you need to find out why it does not start. There are different types of deadness. The battery could have been dead. Would the start, car start? No. My starter could have been dead. Would it have started? No. You all can name part after part after part. If one part was not cooperating with the entire vehicle, what does it mean? It's dead. Why in the church do we do we put deadness on, on pillars? Why if I might be dead by having a foul mouth, but so-and-so is a little, I, this is grammatically incorrect, but I'm going to say it anyway. She may be a little dead or she comes in pregnant. But we're both in a state of being dead if we're not in him. So God said, call the shop and find out to see why is your car dead? Because the text tells us why we're dead. I didn't know why my car was dead. So I had to define what kind of deadness will cause my car to start. And you know I was mad. You want me to tell you why I was mad? Because before I put this thing in a shop, I had got $700 done on my car. You know what that's equivalent to an Adventist talk? I had been in private school all my life. I came to Oakwood and spent a whole lot of money. Mm. I chose the right type of mail. I studied in my classes. I'm a vegan. I did all the right things to enable my car to do what I wanted it to do. But yet it was still dead. So God says, don't you send it to nobody else but the owner. Your car's a Mitsubishi. Send it to the Mitsubishi company. Because the other people may not know what to do with it. Because it's a specific type of dead. It's not a general. It's not just a battery. I could put a, I could send a battery to anybody. Everybody knows how to fix the battery. It's not some people in here don't just have any type of deadness. It's specific. It's that thing that you won't tell nobody else. 
It's that thing that if walls could talk, we all would look at you like, get them out the church. It's, yeah, it's that thing. We have a specific type of deadness, and until you send that person to its owner, it doesn't make any difference who else you send them to. Where the rich young ruler go to? Jesus. And so I called her the Mitsubishi Company. And the man came, and he was like, um, um, can you get the car? I said, well, I pray over it. There's no more I do when a car stop, I pray. And it just cranked back up. So I said, I'm going to lay my hand on this car, and I'm going to pray over my car. And I'm going to try to get it to you all. Now, you may have to give me a ride back. And... I started praying over the car. I kept praying, and Lord, it won't start. So then Kayla taught me something. That's my RA, y'all. Who been stuck? Kayla, she not here. Mm. Okay. So I started praying over the car, and Kayla said, Lorio, anytime you don't know what it is, just, she, this may be a little ghetto, but I pop up the hood, I just start hitting stuff in the name of Jesus. And maybe the starter, I just hit the starter. I hit the battery. I hit everything up underneath my hood. I just started hitting stuff. And so I went back, but sometimes, you know, that's how we do in church, right? We don't really know what y'all issues are. As pastors, we just hit y'all any type of way. Throw this, throw this type of sermon to you, throw this to you, to you any type of counsel. We're not really sure ourselves. That's the reason why you go to Jesus. The reason why you go to Jesus. Because remember what I told you that I was preaching this sermon to who? Myself. Okay? I want to tell you that. So God is the one who gets specific. And if, they, if we're not hearing from him... We may not as not well even talk. You hear me? If we ain't hearing from him, we may not as well even talk. Makes no sense. So, it cranks up. And hitting things and prayer, it cranked up. I went straight to the Mitsubishi Company. Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi, L'Oreal. Mitsubishi Company. And the car cranked up, Antonio. I took it to the Mitsubishi Company. And I dropped up the mask like, it's here. Now, he's he going to ask me, I think by faith we can probably drive you back to West Oaks because I have a way back. So I was like, you can take that faith. But I think if you drive me back, it ain't going to start again. And so he looked at me. He was like, well, then by prayer. Now, look, this is what the owner said. Then by prayer, you got it over here? Now, he don't go to Oakwood. He ain't told me nothing about Jesus. He's just telling me what I told him. He gets back in my car, drives me back to West Oaks, and then he drives it right back to the dealership. Guess what was wrong with my car? Somebody take a guess. I was highly upset. I mean, it wasn't gas. <laughs> it wasn't gas. Guess what was wrong with my car? Huh? No, it's not the alternator. No. It's, this is going to make y'all be like, ooh. I can't wait to you get Huh? Not the... No, that was, the, that was the first problem, but not this problem. He said the battery cable, not erosion. The ignition switch. All I needed to do was be switched on. It was kind of shaky. Now, no, 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 no. But they taught me something. At the end of the day, you can have a very good person. Good people. But if they're not switched on by the right person, they don't work. That. And initial switch is how much it costs. Two hundred dollars just to switch it on. Oh, y'all, the cost is very high to switch us on. So instead of while you were what? Dead in your what? Your trespasses. He made you alive. And you were moving, verse 3, you were moving. You were conducting yourself according to the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, go on down. For by grace. For by grace are we so Anybody know what grace means? I'm going to end it 
on this scripture for by grace. Somebody throw out something to me. What does grace mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, marriage and favor. Yeah, girl. Oh, I put on my paper divine favor. So by divine favor, nothing that you deserve is what you didn't deserve. He favored you. For by grace, he favored you and you what? What's the verb? I need some English major for me. Somebody. Come on. What's the verb? The entire phrase, verbal phrase. Go with me. Watch me. You what? This is very important. What's the verbal phrase? For by grace, you what? Nah. Nah, see, 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 this, this is why we don't come to him sometimes. We don't know what he's doing in our lives. Uh, for by we're going to do this again. For by grace, you what? Have been saved. What does that mean? English major. <laughs> it happened in the past tense. Yes, it happened already. Come on, we ain't finished. We ain't finished with it. Tell me, Jessica, what you say? It's because you were acted upon. Someone ever, I didn't act it. My car couldn't do it by itself. My car couldn't start itself. My car couldn't switch on itself. But it was acted upon by its owner, which is the Mitsubishi Company. Have been saved. For by grace, you have been saved. What's the channel? What's the vehicle, y'all, that we drive this thing in? Faith. Faith. It's the absence, can I give you a quick definition? The absence of all senses. You can't see it. You can't hear it. You can't feel it. You can't walk into it. For by grace, you have been saved. Through what? <laughs> And Brianna, it's not a yourself, girl. You know why I get happy of that? Because I couldn't save my car. It don't matter how much I looked at it. What did I do to get the car to start? I prayed over it. That's the best I could have done by something I thought I owned. That's the best I could have done by something that I thought I owned. What's the pray over it? Y'all think y'all own yourselves? The best you can do for yourself is do what? Oh, y'all getting it. Y'all getting it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourself is a gift, what? From God. It's from who? It came from who? From God. From God. From God. From God. From God. From God. You were shown divine favor from who? From God. Did you deserve it? Nah. Did you do anything for it? Nah. Could you have helped yourself? Nah. Jesus just did it for you. From God. You have been saved. Through faith. That not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Lest what? Any man should boast. Why is that important? What are the pronouns I'm using in this in this thing? Oh, come right here. Can you? Yeah, it's Veronica. I just need to call on the volunteer. She just was. It's all right, it's Veronica. <laughs> Let me tell you why there's a pronoun in this thing. What are the pronouns? Are they singular or plural? Somebody look at the pronouns in the chapter. Are they singular or plural? For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. For we, what? Are his workmanship. What's that? That's plural. Do you know this entire thing that God's talking about is communal? He ain't talking about L'Oreal by himself. You know what that does to change? And I'm about to use her as an example. You know what that does to change this thing now? What the passage is saying is that I can't look at Esperanza and say, I made it. 
I now say, we, through faith. It lowers the level. So anytime you look at me, I'm on the same playing field as you. Anytime you look at your preacher on the same plane, we, through faith, we accepted it. We believed. And because of the community of believers, we now, through faith, accept it. By faith. Thank you. That's very important to understand her position. Because by myself, I can say I did this all by myself. But I did. And I know if truth be told, someone was praying for you. Someone prayed you through some stuff. There was a person who walked in your room while you was crying. And they helped you. There were some teachers who gave you some grace and mercy. You didn't do it by yourself to pass that class. There was someone just a little bit, a little bit smarter. And they had better notes. And you know if you did not use their notes, you wouldn't have passed the midterm. And you didn't make it by yourself. We. In this thing together. That's what Christ invited the rich young ruler to. You not follow me, we, all 12 disciples, I'm going to be in this thing with you. I'm going through this thing with you. To the rich young ruler, you have everything you need in me. And you what is the Bible in with his response, y'all? He didn't get it. Was the Bible in with his response? He went away what? Sad. He went away sad. I just explained to you two chapters of Ephesians. Everything that God is doing for you, that has already done for you, have been saved. Through your faith, to believe in him. Not of yourself is the gift of is the gift of God lest any man should boast. And he went away sad. How do we have to go away sad? Anybody? Any sad people in the house today? Why do we have to be sad? Is this not good news to you? You have been sad. Here's my pill. It's simple. Sometimes salvation is a hard thing to accept. Real talk. Because it said that God did something for me before I even existed. He had a foreknowledge of who I was, and he made an opportunity for me to exist in eternity. So that's why his son died on the cross. Beforehand, God foresaw. He knew I was going to go through at this very moment, so his son went to the cross just for me. And so what he did on the cross has present results and a hope in the future. So the cross, when I believe in him, makes me justified. Justified by faith. I believe that God died on the cross, so it makes my entire past washed away. And so I believe what he did for me on the cross. And so now I step into the right now, today. And I say, God, I thank you for forgiving me of my past. I thank you, God, that by your grace and your mercies, I'm not consumed. And I step into the right now. And then the cross says, by faith, that I have present results today. That I can make it today. That what he did in the past helps me make it today. And then I continue to live and I get older. And Solomon says, remember the courage in the days of your youth before the evil days come. And I get older and I get older and I get older. And based upon the cross, I'll now have a hope and glorification. But it's all in who? Jesus Christ. So do you know the real reason why Jesus asked him to sell everything? Can I tell you the real reason? It was something between he and him. That's it. But oftentimes all we see is the do, 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 do. 
don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. And we run away because we're scared of all those commands from Christ. But all Christ wants is oneness, unity, intimacy, because you cannot be saved in and of yourself. You have to be in Jesus Christ. So if there's anything in his position, he has to remove it. So the rich young ruler had possessions in Jesus' way. He had positions in Jesus' way. And he was proud of his own self for his own accomplishments. And he went away sorrowful. And guess what? That's all he got in life. He had his possessions. He had his position, religious ruler. And he was able to be proud of himself because he was a young man or a young woman. But do you know that we can have more in life than just that? Amen. How many people want to be assured of their salvation in Christ? I know I do. And so here's my appeal. If you like me, understand now as to what Jesus is asking you. Whatever it might be, everybody has that thing. That one thing that we lack. And it's not so much we can't have it, we just don't necessarily want to give it to Him because we kind of like love it just a little bit more than Him. If it's that one thing that you know that just might be in the way, that one thing, first thing I want you to do is stand. If you know it's one thing. It's one thing that's keeping y'all relationship for a bonding, for coming closer. It can be anything. It can be possessions. It can be position. It can be yourself. And now what I want to do, this is called a what? Week of what? And what changes things you are? What started my car? Prayer. For the people who stood, I want to invite you down. We're going to be about to pray. I want to invite you down. The first person that you see next to you, grab their hand. Grab their hand. We're about to pray about this thing. Now, for people who have things they want to give to Jesus, that one thing, we're going to invite you to put in the prayer box. Because all this, we're going to be praying over that one thing that just might be separating you from Christ. So we have this big box right here, this yellow box. And when you get some time, fill out a sheet of paper. It doesn't matter how it looks. You can just put it in there. And what we're about to do is pray over that thing. But more importantly, our hearts, that we will love Christ more. Amen. And through faith, Christ will deal with that thing. Y'all believe that? I'm excited about that. I know I'm not screaming or shouting because this thing is sitting on me right now. I got that one thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace and your mercies that we're not consumed. I thank you, Father God, that we can come boldly to your throne because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And so now, God, we can cry, Abba, Father, because we're your children. And God, we're the sheep of your pasture. I thank you for being our shepherd. I thank you, Father God, that you said that when we choose you as shepherd, we shall not need anything else. For you are all that we need, God. But sometimes it doesn't sit on us, right? Sometimes, Father God, it's not really, that's not really the reality. We have other needs and desires and wants. But God, in you, you said there's fullness of joy. In you, we have peace. In you, we have hope. In you, we have endurance. 
In you, we have patience. In you, we have unity. In you, we have redemption. God, I thank you that everything we need is in you. It's located in Jesus Christ. And God, I ask right now that those things, God, that separate us from you, whatever they might be, as our faces are different, so are those things. I ask, Father God, that you would perfect us in your love, that we will grow in love with you, so that those things, Father God, will, that, that they will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. As we turn to you this week, God, you promised that God, your reward of those who diligently seek you. And so, God, we come. And we thank you for what you can do through Jesus. We thank you for your promises. And they're amen and yes in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father God, that we're saved. And we can believe that thing today. And it's not of ourselves. It's a gift. We thank you for the gift of salvation. And we can't really boast about it, God, but we boast in you. We thank you. We love you for hearing and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Don't forget, whatever it is, whatever prayer request you have, please come put it in the box at the end of the service, okay? Before we conclude, I want to share something powerful that's been going on all throughout campus. I believe that God's put it on our hearts, the hearts of so many people, just to pray more because we realize that's the one thing, that's the one thing that will allow Jesus to actually enter. Guys, we're surrounded by spiritual things and spiritual programs, right? But it's time that you open your heart and really let him in and ask him to dwell with them. The text says that it's in Christ. Correct? That we have all these things. We have been just gearing up and um, we're praying still. Oakwood has kicked off a 40 day of prayer. And uh, I want to share this with you guys. Let me see the hands of everybody who's, who's a part of it, of like the group that's, that act, that's actually going through the 40-day prayer. Let me see you wave your hands. You guys are here. I promise you this. The more you pray, Gloria, thank you for, for selling us on prayer so well. The more you pray, the more you allow Christ to enter. The more faith you have, because you know who you're talking to, because you get to know Him intimately, and the more power you can allow him to have in your life. In other words, the more power he has within to free you from sin and all the things that are holding you back. So real briefly, guys, um, this announcement is just to tell you, if you're seeking to get closer, we invite you to make that commitment, okay? The prayer books are around. If you want a prayer book, see us right after the service. If you want to go through the program, see us right after so we can sign you up and connect you with the prayer partner. And more importantly, around campus, you'll see these prayer boxes. It's not a cop-out to talk to Jesus, you know. It's just something to make it more tangible. Because when you write your request down, what happens is simply that it shows God that you're more serious about it. And then you bring it to Him over and over. And we'll have our elders pray over this box. And it's a secret box. Nobody will read it, but we'll pray over it. And by faith, we trust that God will give you the breakthrough that you've been looking for for so long. So all every night this week, just bring even your letters, write them as you go back to the dorm, bring the requests and place them in the box. We will faithfully pray over them. That is all I want to share with you for now. Remember that Wednesday nights we meet at 6 in the Mosley to have our peer prayer sessions. Whether you're within the 40-day yet or not, we welcome you to come. God bless you all as they prayed up. Good evening, everyone. Um, you've been blessed tonight. We just give God a hand clap for what He's done so far. The Religious Vice Office is very excited about this meet. Tomorrow night, we want you to come back at 7 o'clock. What time did I say? 
7 o'clock and bring other people with you. Um, Jason Francis will be addressing us and we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit. And all of us know we have times when we need the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need more of the Holy Spirit. We all need the Holy Spirit. So I want you to come out tomorrow night at 7 o'clock as we worship and as we get into the Word talking about the Holy Spirit. Also, you know, this is a week of prayer. And so throughout this week, at 1 o'clock each day, we're going to have prayer hotspots where people will be gathering and praying on campus. It will either be at the Eternal Flame at 1 o'clock, the market at 1 o'clock, or the cap at 1 o'clock. And so it's so powerful to take time and come together in prayer in between your classes, in between your lunch, in between all those things to come together and see God's face. So remember, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, and we're having our prayer hot spot at 1 p.m. tomorrow and every day this week at the market, at the Eternal Flame, and at the cap. Would you please stand for our benediction? Dear God, we thank you for using your servant, L'Oreal, dear God, to tell us about the gift of salvation. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his blood. And we thank you for his sacrifice that sets us free, that gives us life and life eternally. Dear God, we thank you for that. Now, I ask that we will not just take this message and let, let us not just leave it in the pew, but Father, let it resonate in our hearts and our lives so that we will leave this place understanding who we are in Jesus, sons and daughters of the Most High God. Take us from this place, but never from your presence. And bring us back at the appointed time. In your son's name we do pray. Amen. Thank you.